It's not two o'clock yet though, right? Right. So thank you everyone for joining us. We're just gonna give it a couple more minutes while everybody gets into uh, the room for Ingenuity, Mars helicopter, how did they do that with the National Aviation Hall of Fame and the National Aeronautic Association. So um, get comfy, you all are in for an out of this world experience. This is where I usually get somebody in the chat who says, you do know you're live, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we do. We're waiting for two o'clock. <laughs> Amy, I see somebody's asking about um, if the um, webinar will be available to view later. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, it'll be available on both our websites. Right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ingenuity Mars Helicopter. How did they do that? Our out of the, this world look at how it came to be that a helicopter is flying on another planet. I am Amy Spowart, President and CEO of the National Aviation Hall of Fame. And I'm Greg Principato, President and CEO of the National Aeronautic Association. This amazing program is the 10th in a series of webinars due to a collaboration between the National Aviation Hall of Fame and the National Aeronautic Association. To learn more about our organizations, please visit our websites. Members of the Hall of Fame and the NAA received advance notice about today's incredible program and we're able to sign up early for this limited opportunity. Please consider becoming a member of our organizations. The National Aviation Hall of Fame honors and celebrates the lives of those who have dreamed things and achieved things that have never been done before. And today's webinar is in that tradition. Today we will hear about a true Wright Brothers moment. During our webinar today, you will hear from the team that transformed into the unimaginable, the unimaginable into reality. Because of the people you're about to hear from, humankind is operating a helicopter known as Ingenuity on the Martian service. These people truly emulate the talent seen in National Aviation Hall of Fame in Chinese. And similarly, the National Aeronautic Association exists to certify new achievement and celebrate those who dare. From the Wrights in Lindbergh to Jackie Cochran through to this day, it's our honor to shed light on great achievement. And what these folks have done, folks you see here is truly a game changer. In fact, they've changed our webinar game a little bit. Our regular viewers know we may maintain an ongoing dialogue, but this information is such that it really requires some uninterrupted time to get across. You'll be able to post questions and we'll attempt to raise them before the webinar is done. To get us started, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bobby Braun, who is Director for Planetary Science at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to set the stage and to for more formally introduce Mimi and her team. Bobby? Uh, hey, everybody. It's great to be here with you today. And I just wanna start by thanking uh, the NAA and the National Aviation Hall of Fame for inviting us and for your commitment to aeronautics and aerospace. Uh, we couldn't be more excited to be with two organizations that understand how important it is to constantly reach for the skies and beyond. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, is a NASA lab managed by Caltech with over 6,500 people who dream about our nation's aerospace future every day. We're in the business of making the impossible possible, of daring mighty things of working together as a team to accomplish grand things for society. And earlier this year, after safely landing the Perseverance rover, our Ingenuity team joined the giants in space exploration by daring and achieving a historic milestone. As you likely know, the first A in NASA stands for aeronautics. 
Uh, and now, thanks to the work of the Mars helicopter team at JPL, some might say we're entering a new era of interplanetary aeronautics. 118 years ago, Wilbur and Orville Wright flew three times successfully on that history-making day in December of 1903. I think the pioneers of powered flight in those early days would be in awe of what our society has accomplished since. Not just that we followed in their footprints, not just, of course, by making air travel a common part of the human experience or landing humans on the moon, but also by achieving powered flight on another planet. Not just once or twice, but now nine times. Uh, the latest coming on July 4th, the day our country celebrates its independence. Ingenuity's Wright Brothers moment came at a time when the world was needing a lift, at a time when science and technology were center stage, and when showing the value of teamwork, what we can accomplish when we work together is as important as ever to society. And that's what I'll always remember about this team, how they came together in this moment and taught us all what teamwork is all about. So thanks again to the, NIA, to the NAA and to the National Aviation Hall of Fame for supporting these innovations. Innovations and inventions that change our perspective of our place in the universe, while also paving new ways of doing business here on earth and improving lives across the globe. I couldn't be prouder of our Ingenuity team and what they've accomplished. And I'm thrilled to be joined here today by some of the core members of this team. Mimi Ong, our project manager, Bob Balaram, the chief engineer, Hovard Grip, uh, our chief pilot, Josh Ravitch, our mechanical engineering lead, and Tim Cannon, our operations lead. You'll get to hear from each of these innovators in just a moment. Uh, back to you, Amy. Yeah, I'm... Sorry, technology. Got um, it. <laughs> thank you, Bobby. <laughs> I would like to remind viewers to go ahead and post your questions and we'll do our best to work them in. I have the absolute amazing pleasure of introducing the leader of the team. Uh, Mimi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone, and thank you for having our team at this event. Uh, we are really excited to be here together to tell you the story of the first chart, please. And I hope Tim shows the picture of Ingenuity Helicopter. <laughs> All right, next chart. So we're here, uh, really happy to be sharing with you the story of Ingenuity Mars helicopter. This is the close up a photo of Ingenuity, the helicopter that has been flying at Mars, as Bobby mentioned, nine and counting. So the key parameters here, the mass of 1.8 kilograms, about four pounds, and the blades tip to tip, 1.2 meters. Uh, and next, so I'd like to start off with the overview of the timeline of you know, how we got to here. And we really started with the question of whether it is possible to fly a helicopter, a rotorcraft at Mars, given the really thin atmosphere. So the first question we addressed is, can one really lift a helicopters in the thin Martian atmosphere? So next chart. And if you click next, we started by building a third scale prototype and taking it into our 25 foot uh, space simulator chamber at JPL with Mars like an atmospheric density. And it, we got the lift, but uh, <laughs> we definitely got the lift. Before that, there were arguments about how long we were going to be flying this. This was joystick from by a person, a team member outside. We're gonna fly 20 seconds, 30 seconds. We got the lift, but we definitely learned that day that we have stability and control of a helicopter in Mars atmosphere is very different. So next chart, <laughs> we got the lift, but so our management and headquarters, everybody gave us another question. <laughs> Can one fly a helicopter in a controlled manner in Mars atmosphere? A fair question. And so that flight, uh, the chart before was December of 2014, right? Next chart. By 2016, uh, we had gone on to build a full-scale proof of concept helicopter. This is a 1.2 meter rotor system uh, with, uh, next chart please, uh, onboard computer-based closed loop control. 
And we went back to the 25 foot chamber and this is May 31st of 2016. And we successfully full, uh, flew the first ever autonomous, you know, closed loop control flight in Mars like atmosphere. Um, this really uh, was a historical moment. Uh, this is the first time anybody had flown a rotorcraft in this thin atmosphere. It was uh, between seven and eight tour uh, atmosphere in the chamber. And the vehicle took off, covered, landed successfully. So personally for me, in my opinion, this was the most important flight in our project. Uh, next chart. So then the next question, at that point, the question of can we fly in a controlled manner fully answered, the next big question become, can one build that helicopter to survive the environment and operate and fly as designed at Mars? So uh, next chart. So then the next is in 2017, our team successfully designed and built that full up helicopter that needs to be, right, to be operated at Mars within that 1.8 kilogram limit. So that was a huge milestone because this entire you see from head to toe came in at 1.78 kilograms, something like that, really under 1.8. And next chart, we took that helicopter back to the 25 foot uh, chamber and now, what you're seeing is the engineering development model flying on its own power. It's carrying its own batteries, all the computer boards that are controlling with the real-time control based on onboard sensors and a fully capable uh, demonstration of the engineering development model. And so, next chart. That in, with that, NASA gave us that ultimate reward or the second almost second to last ultimate reward, which is NASA announced in June of 2018 that we are formally baseline uh, to be flown as a technology demonstration on the Mars 2020 mission. That was a major, major announcement. And then we uh, built the, what we call the flight model ingenuity. Uh, this is what you're seeing here. We built it and tested it by 2019. This is my favorite picture for the whole project because there it is, ingenuity taken days before it was packed at JPL to be shipped to Florida for a final integration to the rover and launch. And then the next one is my second favorite picture on the project, which is Ingenuity integrated on Perseverance Rover, right? Each of these steps that we've been taking since 2014, you know, all the challenges we uh, went through, it was with the dream of us getting to fly the first helicopter on Mars. Well, to get there, we have to get, you know, we have to be taken. And when this picture came across, I'm like, we're really going. <laughs> we are on Perseverance Rover. So this is an extraordinarily important picture for us. And then next, we went to, we got to Mars, and if we can play the video here, uh, Perseverance rover deployed us perfectly onto the surface, and April 19th, all of our dreams from all these many years came true, and there it is, Ingenuity spinning up, now on the surface of Mars, just the way we've seen it done in our own chamber over and over, but there it was, we got to see our Ingenuity spinning up and just, you know, maneuvering uh, all the pre-programmed maneuvers and hovering that full 30 seconds, just beautifully and, uh, you know, landing exactly at plan. So uh, personally for me, this will always be my favorite flight for Ingenuity, my April 19th, 2021, next chart. And, you know, um, just looking at the timeline, how fast it was, right? From December 2014, when we said, oops, we got the lift, but you know, we need autonomous control to May 2016. Yes, we've flown it to by January 18th, flying that full up engineering development model, less than 1.8 kilograms to February 19, ingenuity tested and being delivered to the rover and then launched. And you looking back, each of those steps was really first of a kind, and it was really unnerving, each of these uh, steps that we were, you know, progressing through. Um, and, you know, it was ours to lose. 2020 it doesn't need us, right? We're in a technology demonstration for the future. And if at any of the steps we had a serious setback, it really would have been ours to lose, you know, if we lose the ride. So that was the journey that we took. 
And the next chart, um, you know, the saying of uh, it takes a village. Oh boy, it absolutely did in a programmatic sense, management support and team, you know, working together. So at Nasser, within Nasser are three directorates, the NASA Science Mission Directorate, NASA Aeronautics Mission Directorate, NASA Science Technology Mission Directorate, they came together to support us together to get us the start and to get us going and teams across the many organization you know just the upper management from all the organizations supported thoroughly you know nasa jpl our home organization uh, nasa ames uh, research center nasa langley research center and then in industry air environment was with us from day one qualcomm joined us later solero others it truly really took the full team so next chart uh, I just wanted to close with our team photo, and I'd like to hand it over to Bob Ballaram, our chief engineer. And more importantly, Bob really innovated the conceptual design of Ingenuity, and he converted each and every one of us from the question of really, like how can you fly at Mars to, as Bob likes to say, he shared his Kool-Aid and got us all to drink his Kool-Aid, and that's how we got here. So Bob, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mimi. Uh, next chart, please. Um, so I'm going to just step through, you know, some of the challenges that's associated with flying on Mars. Uh, and so first obvious one, which everybody thinks of is, does Mars even have an atmosphere? Yes, it does. It's 1% the density of what you find here on the Earth's surface. So it's the equivalent of flying at 100,000 feet here on Earth. Uh, which a few planes have done, but it's a major challenge. Uh, and so that's something that needs to be addressed. A Little bit of the lower gravity on Mars helps, but it's still quite a challenge to fly there. So next shot, please. And so there are a number of elements in the uh, Ingenuity helicopter which make that possible. Uh, first of all, from an aerodynamics perspective, there is a very low Reynolds number, which is a characteristic of the air, air flow at these low densities. So the airfoils are really shaped and are very thin to achieve, you know, good lift and those conditions. We obviously have to spin the blades very fast, but we do want to keep the tips from, you know, coming near the speed of sound. We don't want to get any particularly nasty aerodynamics. There's a big challenge in having very high efficiency motors. And this little uh, helicopter can put out 500 watts of electrical power to power those motors. Then of course, there's no point having all of this lift if the mass keeps growing. Uh, at 1.8 kilograms, um, our mass budget as we track the system was tracked at the gram and even at the subgram level. There's a lot of lightweight composite materials, exotic beryllium alloys, and even um, something like aerogel, which you might have heard is this sort of solidified smoke. Uh, it was too heavy to use. We actually ended up using uh, this plain old gas cap. We also had a bit of a secret sauce in this uh, aerodynamics. Uh, we're very honored with the fact that uh, on the underside of the solar panel on the top is a little piece of fabric from the original Wright Brothers plane that flew at Kitty Hawk. So taken together, uh, good engineering and a little bit of a good luck charm, uh, we could fly on Mars. Next chart, please. The second thing about Mars is it's also very far from Earth. There's no joysticking and it really has to be a highly autonomous vehicle. So next chart. So how do we achieve the autonomy? It's, it's a combination of things. Um, first of all, it's a lot of software on board and there's a open source light software framework called F prime developed at JPL that's open source. Uh, we use a high end processor, kind of what you found in your cell phone a few years ago. And we're actually running the Linux operating system on one of the major processes that we have out here. And we're literally leveraging a lot of technology out here. We have so much processing power. It's really in fact, if you compare us with the rover, we are two orders of magnitude more powerful in terms of computing than the main processor on the rover. We have a lot of redundancy built in. Uh, we needed to make a lot of advances in autonomous flight control, uh, which you'll hear about a little bit later. Uh, very challenging control loops running at 500 hertz on the main loops, and then a lot of image processing running at uh, 30 hertz to keep this inherently unstable system up and flying in the air. Next chart, please. Then there is the pesky issue of that Mars gets very cold at night, uh, minus 90 degrees centigrade, which is minus 130. And then as components heat up, we know some of our components during operation go you know, to plus 110 degrees centigrade. So you have a 200 degree temperature swing on some components and the thermal design 
is challenging. Next chart. So how do we do that? Uh, one is the whole issue of keeping things warm through the night. We use carbon dioxide, which is the constituent of the, the mass atmosphere as an insulation. The multiple internal radiation battles. Uh, ingenuity is very much like a, a reptilian in its uh, way it absorbs the sun's energy. There's a very high absorptivity custom coating so that essentially ingenuity basks in the sun during the early part of the day and warms up internally. But once there's also an additional assistance from an active thermal control, which not only keeps the batteries from freezing overnight, but also pre-warms our batteries uh, to allow us to fly with a nice hot battery that can provide those 500 watts of power that, uh, that I mentioned. And so actually it turns out that almost a major chunk of energy is just running things like heaters through the night. It's really the, the flying part in terms of an energy budget is actually a fairly small portion. And it's only now in some of our later flights that we even beginning to see significant energy usage uh, regarding flight. Everything else is really all about keeping warm and surviving the night. Next chart, please. Then of course, there is the whole issue that it has to be not just an aircraft, but it's a spacecraft. Uh, two completely dis different design universes with their own methodologies, uh, their own practices, uh, how you build things in a rugged way. Uh, your vacuum conditions, G-forces and radiations that's not seen by an aircraft. Uh, next chart. So how do we do that? All the parts that we use, including a lot of the com commercial ones were radiation and temperature screened. Uh, we designed and tested the system to withstand uh, pyroshock events. There are a lot of uh, small explosions that go off as we get released uh, onto the surface of Mars. And a lot of vibration loads, which are the functional equivalent of being at a 60G static load, and then there is all the carefully designed and tailored flight processes that allows you to build a spacecraft with all the approved materials and all the approved ways in which you put things together. So you have a very high confidence that things don't fall apart once you're actually in space. Next chart. And it wasn't that we had to do this all by ourselves. We had to be a pitch on the Mars 2020, a major astrobiology mission. We had to be extraordinarily clean. And so the next chart talks about a lot of that. Can I have that please? Next. Okay, thank you. So specifically, a uh, lot of uh, stringent cleaning protocols. Uh, we need to have very low bacterial spore count, no outgassing that would mess up other systems on the rover. Uh, all our interfaces with the rover were sort of a class A, high quality, you know, stringent, most uh, stringent battery tests. We had to guarantee that we didn't you know, interfere in any way with the uh, rover electrically or you know, in, on the radio frequencies. So major issues to make sure that we were the safest and most well-behaved uh, passenger on the rover. Next chart, please. So with that, I would like to hand it over to Howard Grip, our chief pilot and uh, guidance navigation control and aerodynamics lead on the project. Thank you. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So when we started this project, there was a lot that we didn't know. Uh, and I think that's pretty well exemplified by this video, which you already seen, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, if you can play that. Um, it shows you know, very clearly that our challenges here were at the sort of fundamental level. Uh, not just how do you produce lift, but how does a helicopter behave in this thin atmosphere? How does it react when you try to control it? How does it react to disturbances from the environment? And so what we discovered is that what you know, we really need to do is we need to teach us how to fly on Mars. Next slide, please. That teaching process um, you know, be began with modeling and computer simulation. We put a lot of effort into creating our own custom simulation that we live with to this day. And that's been a backbone for a lot of the project. Uh, if you play the first video here, you'll see a video of, uh, of a simulation of our first flight uh, on Mars prior to that flight taking place. What that simulation did is it allowed us to really study the details of what's different between flying on Earth versus on Mars. And maybe just as importantly, it taught us how do we have to build the helicopter in the first place in order to make it possible to fly? Because mechanically you know, and aerodynamically, it's just not the same. And so it comes to things like sizing the rotor and how stiff does it need to be? What kind of control authority do you need? 
Those are all things that we learned using those tools. And then we launched into an intensive test program with aerodynamic experiments in our 25 foot space simulator. If you play the next video, you'll see just one of many, many experiments that we did there where we uh, exercised the rotor controls and, and measured how the system responded in terms of forces and torques uh, to those ints. And only after doing all of that, we could then graduate to actually performing free flights. Next video, please. Um, that video shows one of, of those uh, flight tests that we did. And at this point, when we were flying with this kind of hardware, we were no longer in a mode where this hardware was dispensable. It's not like we could have a crash like what Nimi showed with that early vehicle. Uh, this was, you know, um, value hardware uh, that, you know, it didn't have to work. So every time we went to, you know, got to this point of actually flying a helicopter, it was a little bit of a heart stopping moment. You know, is it really going to work? And it did every time. Um, and we never had, we never had a crash. Um, next uh, slide, please. So one of the big challenges of all this, but that's also, you know, what made it, you know, all the more fun is that there is no textbook answer to how you build a test program for a Martian helicopter. So we kind of had to use our creativity a little bit here in how do we, you know, build up the right tests. Um, one of the things that we wondered, for example, is like, how do we, how do we measure uh, how the helicopter react to airflow over the rotor? Like, you know, would be caused by a gust. So you play the first video, you see one device that we built explicitly for that purpose, and you see it in action there, swinging the helicopter back and forth into, in the chamber, just so that we could get some airflow of the rotor and measure how the helicopter responded to that. Later on, we decided that's not enough. And if you play the next video, you'll see uh, a helicopter in front of the next thing we built, which was a wall of fans. And these are CPU fans, you know, the kind that you, you know, we had to scour the internet for these to find 900 of them that we put in the chamber and blow air at the helicopter. And of course they weren't made for this environment. So they would overheat within a few minutes of us turning them on. So every time we had to choreograph all our tests very carefully and so that we could fit it right into this little window. And if we didn't manage to do that, then we all had to you know, go out for lunch and, and come back later on in the day in order to try the experiment again. Um, another thing that we did a lot of is just flying the helicopter by hand, which you see in the middle here. Uh, it looks a little silly, but, but it's actually quite useful for certain types of tests. And then when it comes to gravity, uh, because gravity is higher on Earth than on Mars, we had to help it out a little bit in a lot of our tests. And we had to you know, basically lift up on it, you know, give a little bit of assistance in the least obtrusive way that we could come up, come up with. And that least obtrusive was by using fishing line. So you can see that on the picture on the, on the right there is, is a helicopter hanging from a thin piece of fishing line. And that was also you know, just a little bit nerve wracking to have our, our, our precious hardware hanging on that thin piece of, of, of line. Next slide, please. Another challenge of flying on Mars is we don't have GPS. And so the helicopter, you know, in order to keep track of where it is at any point in time, we had to build a navigation system, which we did by using a camera looking down on the ground together with other sensors. Um, and in order to make this lightweight enough uh, that you fit on the helicopter, we had to use the kind of sensors that you find in your cell phone or that you can buy for your drone. These are a couple of examples of those here. And we assembled a custom system based on that. And in testing that, we kind of went into our backyard behind JPL. If you play the next video, you see a short clip of what that looked like flying our navigation system on a surrogate uh, helicopter um, behind JPL. Next slide, please. So now that Ingenuity is operating on Mars, we're finally getting to see, you know, how well is it all working? You know, is it meeting our expectations? And the answer is it is. It's, it's actually, it's, it's performing beautifully. It's really in very good agreement with all of those simulation models that we spend all the time putting together. Um, and at this point, um, it's traveled, you know, over 1.6 kilometers over the course of nine flights. So just for reference, in those tests that we did in our chamber here at JPL, we could go half a meter from one side, you know, to the other. And that was it. And now it's gone 1.6 kilometers. So that, that's pretty exciting. 
the one exception to everything just you know performing perfectly was in in flight six where we had a little bit of a wild ride because of a triad being anomaly in the images that arrived 30 times per second into the navigation algorithm um so that made for some interesting flying but some fairly large oscillations but the helicopter survived that fine uh, because of the robustness of first of all the algorithms that are flying it but also just because it's built, you know, to to you know withstand, you know, a little bit of a beating, and so with that, I you know would like to hand it over to our mechanic who can take credit for a lot of that. Uh, Josh Ravage. All right, hello everyone. Um, yeah, Tim, did you want to go to the first slide? Thank you. Um, so yeah, as uh, Bob and Hovard uh, mentioned, there are a lot of requirements to, to meet for uh, for building a Mars helicopter. Uh, you know, not only the problems of designing a full aircraft uh, in a very weird environment, uh, trying to keep mass low, trying to manage temperatures, both hot and cold. Uh, you're also designing a spacecraft that has to get there and survive uh, you know, transport on a rocket, on a rover to another planet. Uh, so as I walk through the next few slides, a little bit more of the detailed design, uh, you'll see a few recurring themes in how we accomplish that. Uh, some of those, uh, you know, solutions are a lot of very custom, lightweight, uh, um, very strong uh, structures, uh, a lot of uh, commercial, um, you know, miniaturized electronics as possible, as well as a, a lot of multifunctionality, sharing of space, sharing of function between the various components. Uh, Tim, you want to go to the next slide? So I'll start at the top, go to the bottom. Uh, at the top, uh, we have Solar Array. Um, Solar Array actually ended up being quite a bit larger than originally, uh, you know, originally, originally planned, if you've seen some of the early pictures of, of the vehicle. Uh, so it, it, it was a challenge, right? We had to make this uh, structure lightweight. We had to make it, it's actually quite long. Um, if you look at the side view, it's, you know, probably about I don't know, a third of the length of the whole vehicle. We had to keep that from vibrating too much, uh, both for for helicopter flight, not to you know mess up the control, but also not break uh, during during launch. So we use a lot of uh, weird materials here. We use uh, carbon fiber with foam core on the inside. You'll see that uh, coming up here and there throughout the vehicle as well. Make it very strong, very uh, very lightweight, very stiff. But the solar ray also doubles as uh, the antenna mount. You see a little wire antenna right in the middle. Um, there's a, a custom antenna we built. Uh, the antenna ground plane and antenna mount actually is part of the solar array. Uh, uh, it also triples as the electrical interface to the rover. Uh, it's hard to see in this angle, but there's a little green area there. Uh, in conjunction with the Perseverance team, we actually had to invent a new uh, separation method. Uh, you know, there's a separable electrical interface. We had to really kind of invent a new method for doing that. Um, using existing technology in a new way. And uh, yeah, we got down what normally would take, you know, probably hundreds of grams for a separation connector down to maybe one or two grams of, uh, you know, mass remaining on the vehicle after separation. Uh, you want to go to next slide? Uh, of course, uh, probably what everyone's interested in, the blades. Uh, blades are about you know, a little over a half a meter, like foot and a half long each. Uh, they are uh, as well carbon fiber, very thin carbon fiber layer over foam core, and each blade weighs about 40 grams, so one and a half ounces. Uh, it's hard to really give you a perspective until you pick one up. It's, it's like holding a feather. It's, it's really unbelievable to, <laughs> to feel them. Um, as well, uh, propulsion motors, the, these little discs that you see on top of the blades are actually custom built motors uh, with a brilliant alloy that uh, Bob mentioned, hand wound motors, uh, extremely lightweight, um, you know, very, you know, very specialized design to, to the helicopter. Uh, as well, the hubs that hold everything together, uh, custom carbon fiber, as well, uh, miniaturized swash plate mechanisms on both rotors that provide uh, both cyclic and collective. I right, wanna go to the next slide. Uh, moving downwards, start at the left, uh, the legs, uh, legs, uh, carbon fiber tubes, feet are very, uh, very custom, uh, thin shelled carbon fiber uh, designed that way to try to, um, you know, avoid uh, sinking into the surface, handle any type of, you know, surface, whether soft or hard that you land on, um, as well as landing at, you know, off angles. Uh, trying to keep the legs. Uh, if you look at the top of the legs, there's a um, actually a titanium, a uh, little titanium structural mount plus a little damper to keep it from bouncing too hard. Um, and then over the right, uh, the mass, it's hard to see there's so much stuff on it, uh, but another uh, very custom, uh, uh, custom design uh, carbon fiber spine. Uh, that holds the whole vehicle together, but it also serves as an electrical conduit. And there's about 70 wires running through the inside of that thin carbon fiber tube, uh, heading to both uh, both motors, uh, you know, both rotor systems as well as up to the to the rover. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then down at the bottom, inside the little uh, thermal compartment uh, where all electronics live, it was uh, kind of a trick trying to shove all the systems of spacecraft and an aircraft into this little box, especially when a lot of that box is filled up with a, a thermal insulation gap. Um, even trying to hold that gap in place was very difficult. Uh, you see these little yellow stalks sticking out of the edge of the, the green circuit boards. Those actually hold an internal blanket that's uh, you, know, you can't see behind the, the, the normal blanket. Um, that was tricky. Uh, you look at the way the, the boards are designed. We use a lot of commercial components on them, uh, industrial automotive grade components as well. Um, but the boards and the batteries, which really hard to see on the inside of everything, they're, they're actually their own structure. Instead of having a frame kind of holding everything together, we've got little angle brackets that just hold the boards together. They make a giant, you know, just, they make a box with the batteries as a central core and uh, they really support themselves, um, which is uh, quite, quite different than our, our normal approach. Um, you can see down at the bottom, the altimeter uh, lives there. Our cameras actually live on, on the altimeter. They bond to the, to the altimeter. That's our main structural mount. And up at the top, our very tiny IMU, if you look, our normal spacecraft IMU, if you look at the one that's on the rover, is about the size of a coffee can. Um, this one is about an eighth of an inch square by you know, a little bit less than that tall. So ex extremely tiny, less than a gram in mass. And uh, our inclinometer chip uh, is our structural mount for our, our IMU as well. Very hard making this work. Um, you know, try to keep vibrations down from you know again. You know, have to get as close to the center of mass as we can. Try not to shake it around too much to you know again to to affect the the control of the vehicle. Uh, next slide. And uh, yeah, lastly, how, how do you hold it, right? We've got a vehicle that can now you know, sort of fly on Mars, but you also have to hold it properly. If you look at it, it's not really conducive to, to holding well. There's not really a good place to grab this. So we ended up grabbing it at the top and the bottom with uh, separation mechanisms. Uh, you can see on the bottom right, uh, once they let go, it kind of swings, uh, swings the helicopter into vertical position before drop. We also had to support the blades. It's a, a large question. Do you hold them tightly? Do you let them go free? Uh, we ended up having little spring plungers underneath the roots of the blades. You can't really see it in this view, but it's it's under there. Um, they kind of keep them from bouncing around. It just foam guards just in case it happens to, to contact. Um, as well, we had to hold the legs uh, out of the way. So developing very lightweight, uh, you know, uh, hinges, uh, latches, so they can swing out of the way. As, as you swing down, if the legs were deployed, they actually hit the ground before we got vertical, as you can see here. So um, yeah, uh, we ended up working a lot with Perseverance team. Some of it, I'd say luck, but a lot of, a lot of determination, a lot of hard work from the team you know, pulled it off. Uh, next, uh, I will hand it over to Tim. All right, so I am Tim Canham. I am the operations lead for the helicopter. And it was my job essentially to deliver a functioning and healthy helicopter to Hovard so he could fly. So it was my job to design all the ground tools, all the ground processes to interact with the rover team to do the planning and get us to the point where we could actually fly. And so here's a, here's a nice quick view of the Mars helicopter system itself on the right. The, the project has given our helicopter the affectionate name of Ginny. And you can see there, standing by itself, you can see the helicopter electronics cube, as Joshua mentioned. And uh, there are two processors in that cube. There is the, the Snapdragon Qualcomm processor that Bob mentioned that's really powerful and where we do our imaging and our, and, and our uh, feature tracking analysis. It also acts as the general interface for storing data and talking to the rover. And uh, it, as Bob mentioned, we also use the F-Prime software framework. It's, it's an open source framework that's now in GitHub. So if people want to go to GitHub, download it, they can play with it and do their own demo on Raspberry Pi. But many of the same components there are the ones that are running on the helicopter. So that's kind of a cool tie-in. And the second processor that we have is a TI automotive grade microcontroller that does really the, the, the trusted interloop GNC uh, guidance and navigation algorithms. It also does the closed loop control on the motors along with a uh, field programmable gate array called FPGA. Between all of them, they're doing the, they're the board that's doing the actual flying of the helicopter. It also connects to all the guidance sensors that we mentioned, the, the inertial guidance unit, the inclinometer and the altimeter and provides a way to get that data to the, to the guidance software. So those two processors all play together on the helicopter to do a flight. And we only power up the automotive controller when we want to do a flight. So we were able to control it that way. So on days that we talk back to the rover, when we're just transferring data, we don't need to turn it on and save the power. And 
What's very, what's very interesting to a lot of people is that the radio system that we use to talk back to the rover is actually a Zigbee radio. This is a very popular radio in home automation. If you've ever controlled your thermostat or sprinklers or other things, it's a very reliable radio uh, protocol that uh, it's not super fast, but it's been extremely reliable during our, during our project. By our estimate, over, after millions and millions of radio packets sent back and forth between the rover, so far, we've counted a total of about two that we've dropped. It's been extremely reliable. And so the way this is, the way that we actually interact with the rover is we, we built and delivered a whole nother box called the, the helicopter base station. You can see a, a view there with a the cover off. It takes the same boards that are on the helicopter electronics on that image in the upper right, and it just refolds them into a different shape and interconnects them in a different way so that we can reuse a lot of the work that we did on the avionics boards. So that box has that same Zigbee radio and it acts as an instrument payload on the rover. So we talk to, a, to the rover via a good old fashioned UART interface, a serial port. And that's how we, how we do our flights is, is a Percy, as it's affectionately known, will turn on the base station and the ground team is to, has, has developed commands and sent them to the rover. And the base station waits for the helicopter to wake up and then commands the helicopter. And so, the helicopter gets all the credit because it's doing the exotic, exciting flights, but the base station has also been soldiering on quietly doing its work and without any problems and providing a place for us to uh, interact with the rover. So that kind of gives you an idea of how it works. So Percy will wake up the base station, talk to the helicopter. So what I wanted to do next was show a chart that shows the path of the data. It's actually quite complicated in many ways because as other people have mentioned here, there's no operator on Earth just standing there joysticking the helicopter around. And the way that the rover itself operates on Mars, a Martian day is called a SOL. What the rover does is every morning, there are the, the Perseverance team sends all the commands to the rover for the day. So as part of the Perseverance team, we write all of our commands under what are called a sequence. It's just essentially a long list of commands that do whatever activity we want for the day. So on a flight day, that sequence just includes all the commands we need to do to do a flight. So the Ingenuity team develops, designs, and, and tests these sequences. And then on the day we want to do a flight or any other activity, we take those sequences and we deliver them to the Perseverance team. The Perseverance team in that morning uplink to the rover will send all those rover commands that include not only what the rover is doing, but what the helicopter is doing, they set up a whole batch of commands. And then those commands execute during the Martian day. So sometime during the Martian day, we, we've been typically doing our flights around noon Mars time. And that's when, that's when the base station wakes up and talks to the helicopter. You can see the helicopter commands go over to the rover. Um, uh, and then from the rover to the helicopter. And then we do our flight. And in, during all this time that the helicopter is broadcasting data back to the rover, which is sampling it and storing it for later downlink. But because all these commands are sent early in the day on Mars, and then essentially Earth disconnects, all of our flights have been with nobody watching. Unless you, unless you include Perseverance itself with those glorious videos we got early in the flight, but there's no humans watching any of this happen. And then later in the day, after we've done our flight and we've stored the data on the rover from the flight, they'll have an afternoon pass, what they call an afternoon orbiter pass, where there's a number of orbiting spacecraft around Mars and they come into view at a certain time and the rover is pre-programmed to wake up and communicate with the orbiter and relay all the data from the activities it's been doing that, that SOL. So, so helicopter is very unique, but at the same time, it fit right into the way that the rover did business. So they didn't have to do anything really special in some ways for us, but they just included us in their normal activities. So after it's sent to the orbiter, it comes down to the ground system. And that's when the helicopter team is waiting to pounce. If you remember the flight one video, for any of you saw it, you saw our, our downlink lead, Michael Starch saying, we're waiting for data to come into the ground system. He was giving these live updates and then all of a sudden on our displays, we see all this list of data from the rover. Then we're like, yeah, it's here. And we just, we start the whole process cranking on the ground. And as you can see here, cheering results, especially after a flight, we get to see the data and we get to do plots of the data. We get to analyze the data and look at the great pictures from Mars. 
And so that's really the process. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a very complicated flow of commands in, in the morning and to the Rover and then back to the helicopter team to do our analysis. And so how this was not a typical year for us. So what were some of the challenges that we did that we had? Essentially, we all had to head home in March of 2020. And so we had to redo it, our team and how we all interacted to do everything remotely. And it was very fortunate that as a team, we'd had, if you want to think of it, three or four years of bonding. You know, we were all in the scrum together, solving problems, discussing issues, doing testing. And we really learned to work together well as a team. And so even though we worked remotely, we really made it work. And we, 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 just, we figured out how to run all of our tools, get all of our data and interact. And this is a small sample, just to give you an idea. This, is, this was the smaller team that operated the helicopter during cruise because when we were on the way to Mars, we still had to top off the battery. We just didn't store the helicopter and tell them we'd see them in six months. We had to monitor the helicopter's health and keep it charged. But, and we did this all remotely and we've done pretty much um, the entire project up to date remotely with the exception of coming in on the days that we had flights so we could see the data live together. The other challenge has been Mars time itself. Uh, the Martian day is about 24 hours and 40 minutes compared to 24 hours on Earth. So as you can see over time, the Martian day walks with respect to the Earth time. And so as a helicopter team, we had in the early part of the project, the entire project was on what they call Mars time where they're tracking the Martian day rather than the Earth day. So the whole team shifts by almost an hour every day. And that can wreak havoc on your sleep schedule, make it challenging to do everything. So the entire prime mission in April was done on Mars time. So as a team, we had some late nights looking at data and figuring things out. Our first anomaly that we had, the hardware anomaly, that happened in the dead of the night when we were processing the data. So we still had to keep our wits about us and react even though we were on Mars time. And our testing, how do you test when you're all remote? Well, we had the lab set up. Uh, so that we could test remotely. We had we were able to log in and run tests with nobody there. And with the exception, if you see if you see here in the middle, there's our EDM2 helicopter, which was a second engineering model. So we bring the crew in and do some of the early commissioning tests like the blade release and the 50 RPM test. And we had people there because we were spinning actually spinning hardware. But over against this wall has been the workhorse through the entire project as we have a representation or a copy of the base station and the avionics from the helicopter itself and we've run many tests to prepare for flights on Mars. And finally, as I mentioned, the anomalies. There was lots of things we sweated going into this. We were sweating how much energy we would have. We were sweating how the radio, how well the radio would work. And all these things worked brilliantly. You know, we were, but we, but we had these things come out of nowhere that we had to deal with. We had those two anomalies. Hobart actually mentioned one of them in flight six with with the imaging, but we had an earlier one where we discovered on Mars a hardware bug that was preventing us from uh, actually operating the vehicle and making, allowing it to spin fast for flights. So we had to do a, in parallel, in the space of only a few days, we had to do two parallel tracks of investigation where we found a workaround using existing test commands so that we could poke the hardware and get it to work for us almost all the time. And then at the same time, in parallel, we were preparing a software update to help fix that problem. And we did this all in the space of three or four days to get it ready. And that workaround, the software command workaround actually got us through our prime mission. And then just recently, we updated the software to get that nagging worry about the flight being aborted not, by not being able to fly. And we did another software update to solve the problem that Hobart described with the imaging. So we've already updated the software twice on Mars. Those of you who've updated Windows at home, you know, just think about doing that on Mars from 100 million miles away, and it's it's got its own challenges and, and nervousness. But all in all, this has been a the team has worked amazingly well together. There's a great group of talented people, each contributing their own level of expertise, and we get to celebrate this all together now. So at this time, I'll turn it back to Amy. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, I, after hearing this, seeing all the uh, lively chat question and answer, I just feel like going like this. 
It's remarkable. All the, like, I'm so glad that um, Bob mentioned the Wright brothers um, because I am in Dayton, Ohio, the birthplace of aviation. We're very proud of, of being here and um, even more proud that, um, that there's a little piece of fabric from the Wright, the original flight in Kitty Hawk um, created right here in Dayton up there on Mars right now, thanks to all of you. Um, I'm, I'm going to open up some questions now, and, and I do know that there are a lot of really good questions and um, chat going on. If any of the panelists at any time see something that they feel strongly that they want to address, please let us know. And, and know that we have everybody from young school kids to, um, you know, people around the world at high level. Um, so the, question, the questions and, and comments uh, are a huge range. So. Um, anything you feel you'd like to address. Otherwise, Greg and I are going to try to work that in. Um, Mimi, I have about 10 emails and texts right now saying, Mimi's amazing. Her enthusiasm is contagious. Um, and I, I love in your presentation that you addressed kind of that it, it wasn't all easy, that there were some failure. So can you tell us a little bit about how you um, how you handled those failures, and, and I'm sure there were naysayers, I'm sure there were obstacles. How did you um, persevere, and how did you keep your team motivated and, and you know, looking forward? Yeah, um, I think the first and foremost is we all believed in the fundamental why we're doing it. I think all of us, as we were going through this, all the challenges is we wanted to add aerial dimension to space exploration. You know, we have spacecraft orbiting, you know, planets and we have rovers, but we're not flying, right? We're not using that dimension. So I think it's really important that you, we have a team that really is driven by this much higher cost than any of us. So I think we were, first of all, bonded by that. Uh, second, you know, in terms of, um, you know, anybody saying, uh, hey, uh, we don't think it's possible. Are you sure it's possible? Um, that's an interesting one because some of the folks who really fairly question because there, there is supposed to be so little atmosphere, they are the most respected, you know, people in our community and we have very, you know, mutual respect. And so that, I think the answer is really back to the fundamentals. You know, we started from the aerodynamics and, you know, the CFD analysis that Ings and Langley supported in going on to the simulations that Hobart, you know, demonstrated and saying fundamentally, we know it's possible. And so really taking one step at a time. So the part that I was presenting really is taking a systematic uh, steps and not disrespecting the question. It is fair to question. We all question each other. I think this critical thinking is part of what engineering is all about, but answering it systematically. So I think for me, um, when I joined the team, Bob had the Kool-Aid long before any of us. Mm -hmm. I think my Kool-Aid drinking came to the uh, critical level of, um, about the time that I really saw and caught up with the CFD analysis and the closed loop control simulation that says, okay, we should be able to do it, but yes, maybe we cannot do it because we can build such a thing or it's gonna get too heavy. So beyond that, it becomes a very engineering practice. So in a lead, as a lead position, I think my biggest job was to make sure that all the technical disciplines had that ultimate diversity that really melded together. You know, and Bob talked about managing to grams and subgrams. He's not kidding, right? I think I've said in a few places, he and Eric Archer, who I really miss, we don't have him anymore. But anyway, I remember that Bob, the argument you and you know Eric Archer were having about, I think it was three or four grams. Eric wanted a better antenna, and Bob's like, no. And so I think my yeah, I think my contribution was really uh, making sure that we all gave all the disciplines a chance to talk through it. The second thing is that um, I think Havad mentioned it, or, or maybe uh, Josh mentioned just now, and, and Tim too. Every discipline had to excel on their own, but not in their own world. That they really had to know the full helicopter system. I mean, one meeting, there was something about a rotor blade system and some challenge we're doing, talking. Next thing, I think it was Tim that says, oh, okay, buddy, we can solve it in software. Everything was touching everything. So I think those were, you know, being open-minded and having the ultimate sense of uh, working together was how we overcame the challenges. Uh, and Mimi, you talked about um, discussions and disagreements and all that. I know we talked last year you know it's coming, and I'm hoping that everybody who had a different opinion weighs in here on the team. Um, why did you call it a helicopter and not a drone? Oh, okay. Well, okay. This is totally me, and this I'm sure a lot of people disagree. 
I really didn't want the word drone used for a Mars helicopter engineer, you know, this first round for the following reason. As you're hearing, right, this was fundamentally challenging. I mean, this 1.8 kilograms, you know, is really hard. And so I think what, you know, in Hobart's and, you know, Ames and Langley Aerovironment area, even modeling the blade, you know, modeling it into 32, 33 equivalent pieces and modeling lift and drag of each of these, you know, little pieces, integrating them together and getting the dynamics and modeling the whole simulation around it and sending those out, like simulations determining how to specify hardware requirements and software requirements. So we were going back to really like the Wright brothers, you know, because fundamentally things were so different on Mars. There we go. <laughs> things are so different and we really were tackling the fundamentals. To me, the drone is like a developed technology you can order online, you know, and you have to learn to fly it, but you know, we should be able to learn to fly it. We were writing the fundamental equations and building the testing them. So I really felt strongly that it be called a Mars helicopter until now we're getting close to when it becomes a norm one day, right? To fly a helicopter at Mars, we totally, we really now understand the fundamentals. We really understand the equation. We're ready to go forward. When they become a norm, please feel free to call it a drone. Anyway, for that reason, I've always been very emphatic about not using the word drone, but I think other team members should kick, hit me on the head because, you know, what's the big deal? I don't know. I felt very strongly about it. I think that's great. I, th I think that's an outstanding uh, answer to that. Hey, Bob, um, what what's your biggest what's your biggest surprise in this whole thing? What 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 was easier or harder than what you expected? Well, you know, I was motivated by the fundamental physics and engineering. So at one level, you know, there is no surprise. But at another level, it's the sheer interplay between all the technical disciplines that had to be managed and thought through. I learned so much. I learned more from the team than you know anybody could possibly imagine. I had to touch every technical discipline. And so what surprised me was that when you have a clean slate, uh, where you don't have a lot of boundaries between subsystems, you really get some really, really wonderful engineering uh, done. And the fact that that went through so well and the proof is there, you know, and Mars has been somewhat benign in the sense that Many of our worst case contingency scenarios never came to be. But I think the very fact that we designed and planned for all kinds of contingencies has led us to a place where a somewhat benevolent Mars has allowed us to fly you know, very robustly. Um, I was, uh, so I, at some fundamental level, I don't have a really major surprise, but it's been extraordinarily pleasant to see everything you know, work out great. Alvard, um... So a two-part question. Um, somebody um, on, on the um, who tuned in wants to know if you have a pilot's license here on Earth. First, first part, uh, yes or no. But then um, talk a little bit about you know practicing flying in conditions that can only be simulated and really kind of guess. That, I mean, you have science that tells you what it's probably like there, but it's still sort of you know you have to simulate it and all that. Did, did all the simulations give you? Do you feel like an accurate depiction of what you faced? So number one, do you have a pilot's license? And then that second part. Yeah, so the answer to the first one is yes, I do have a pilot's license. And I, I used to, before I came down to Southern California, I used to live in Eastern Washington, right on the border between Washington and Idaho. And I used to have a Cherokee 140 uh, that I flew around in there. And anyone, you know, it's on this call, has ever been there, you'll know, you know, just how beautiful it is up there and, and you know, just a great place to fly. Um, now, as far as the simulations, you know, how, how do you practice something with this? You know, first of all, it's, it's not just any simulation, right? It's, uh, we put a lot of effort into this. Uh, and, you know, it does model everything down, you know, from like the blade level, you know, tiny slices of the blades, you know, and the forces that arise from that, up to the big picture of the terrain that you're flying over. And the camera that, you know, is taking images of that terrain and feeding it into the flight software. And, gives us, you know, very sort of end to end tool that we can work with. And so I, you know, I did get some questions, you know, at various times, like, why aren't you out, you know, flying, you know, a drone and practicing this and, you know, seeing how it bounces on landing and doing all this stuff. And I said, well, you know, we are practicing, but it, it's, it's in simulation. And, and this is, you know, we're putting, you know, our eggs in that basket and we're going to trust it. And, and it turns out, you know, 
we were able to do that. And maybe even more than I even, even dared you know, hope for, because it has been extremely predictive of, of what's been going on on Mars. And even some of the things that we could do in simulation that I wasn't sure, you know, is this really, you know, telling us the truth? Well, yeah, you know, it turns out in, you know, Mars is pretty much as robust as, as what, we, um, what we found in simulation. Um, Josh, I have kind of a, a, a technical question that somebody put in the um, Q&A that I think is super interesting, and then also more of a, a general question. Uh, the question from the Q&A for Josh is, um, was there any special lubricants used um, on, on Ingenuity? And then also, um, interesting to think about your, um, your emotions from um, take off to the point when we saw everything come down. I, I know you probably get that question a lot, but I think, how did that feel to you? Can you walk us through it? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, let me do the technical one first. Um, we do use lubricants there. I mean, I guess they're not special in the space industry, but maybe they're special relative to, uh, you know, to Earth. We use both combination of uh, dry foam lubricants as well as uh, uh, oil-based lubricants, um, but they're, they're fairly common in space for low outgassing. Um, you know, they might not be as, you know, good in some ways as, as earth, you know, some earth lubricants we use, but they're, they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty standard. Um, yeah, materials, I, I won't give you necessarily the names, but uh, yeah, they're, 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 they're definitely there. We use a few different types. Uh, as far as how I feel, I, I don't know, that's a tough question. I'm sure we're all, <laughs> Uh, stricken with a lot of emotions, um, you know, on one hand, I think engineers tend to just be very, uh, you know, focused on like, okay, let's just do the job and get it done. And uh, Mimi will always say that, you know, me and a few others on the on the project never let her celebrate <laughs> until it was over. Uh, um, but yeah, it's just, I don't know. I, I, I can't answer that question. Maybe some of the others have a better answer for how, how they feel about it. Just, you know, you feel kind of pride and happy you're able to, you know, contribute to something like this. But, um, yeah, I imagine, yeah, Bob and Mimi and Havard. Yeah, I, and, I can, I can honestly have... say that, I can honestly say that Mimi captures the entire emotional gamut of everything the team has <laughs> felt. So you want to know what we feel like, uh, Mimi says it the best. So just, just watch her not only here, but elsewhere. And she just does that so well. So thank you, Mimi. Uh, well, I can also chime in, yeah, Josh, and then we always have to watch Hovart's expression after every test flight. If he's not smiling, I knew that I wasn't allowed, I wasn't supposed to smile. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hovart has sort of that young Liam Neeson look, I think, you know, looking at him, looking at him right here. Um, hey, uh, Tim, um, you were turtle on the software side and all that kind of thing. Um, were there, I, mean, I can't imagine, you know, trying to do something like this in the software side with no precedent whatsoever. So maybe talk about that for a second, but also are there any lessons that you learned in doing all this that might be applicable to help pilots or others here on earth? So to maybe the, the first one would frame the second. Uh, so one thing that JPL is known for is the fact that we take on really hard jobs that have never been done before and we do them, but behind that isn't just taking something out of the air and improvising, we have a lot of institutional experience when it comes to writing flight software and designing the flight hardware that it operates on. And so really in the helicopter software and avionics, we had a fusion of the two. We had a very unique helicopter design, the, avi the, the actual flight system itself, but we also paired it with good practices about designing the hardware and testing it. And the software I mentioned earlier that we are using F prime, which is a flight software framework that we didn't invent that for helicopter that's been used in other projects on JP at JPL. And we're able to leverage lessons that we've gotten from other projects, including the Rover projects about how to design flight software in such a way that we can operate it. And the flight software has done very well and it's helped us to even work around problems that we found. And, and it gives us bushels of data gives lots of visibility into the spacecraft, you know, that's the helicopter. And so it's really a fusion of the unique technology development that we did for helicopter, but also leveraging JPL's institutional experience about how to build these things in the correct way for a flight system. And so in light of that, um, as far as lessons that somebody on earth, you know, a pilot or somebody else um, learning on earth, I think the helicopter is unique enough that it was really designed to be in, to have, you know, autonomy 
you don't have human operators flying it around. So I don't know how much applicability it could be used to a, an earth vehicle that's typically flown by a pilot. But <clears throat> um, given that what we've learned on helicopter, just through the design and testing and, and actually operating it on the surface of Mars, we do think that this can feed forward into future helicopter projects or other similar ones. Like there's gonna be a drone on Titan or a helicopter on Titan to use the right term. And we've had some discussions with them where they've kind of looked over our shoulder to see how we operate. So I think there's some great lessons going forward to the next projects, but it also leverages the experience we've had at JPL on how to design these sorts of things. So is that a way of saying that Amazon's going to deliver on, no, just kidding. <laughs> well, Amazon did, well, we, we can say that Amazon delivered us a bunch of parts, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Late night sessions in the lab and we, we needed just that particular cable and the next morning it was there, right? Right on. Um, I'm going to shoot a question over to Bobby because I think it kind of follows on with what Tim just said. Hey, um, Bobby, you've worked with JPL on a number of missions. Was Ingenuity the most memorable for you? Wow, that's a great question. Um, they're all memorable, to be honest. But uh, for most people at, at JPL, it's, it's the first mission that is uh, the one that you remember. And in my case, uh, that was Mars Pathfinder. Uh, which landed in 1997 and carried, as you may remember, this uh, Sojourner rover. There's an image of it actually uh, over there, over my shoulder. Um, and the Sojourner rover was a little rover uh, about the size of a baby uh, that led, that, that set the path, if you will, for all the future rovers that we have uh, embarked upon. So path, uh, Sojourner led to the Spirit and Opportunity, which led to the Curiosity and Perseverance rovers uh, that are now operating on Mars. And uh, I believe that Ingenuity is much in the same mold uh, as Sojourner. I think it's a pathfinder. It's taught us a lot. It's proven that we can accomplish uh, science from this new vantage point, as Mimi pointed to. You know, Flight 9 proved the science potential uh, of this system. The, the science team is incredibly excited about the, the results that were returned. And I think just as uh, Sojourner led to these other rover missions, Ingenuity will lead to future uh, aerial flights on Mars and on other planetary bodies. There, there have been a couple of questions about the conditions on Mars. Um, for, for anybody, um, maybe Hobart, maybe some others, um, you know, is there surface wind? Um, um, what are Ingenuity's wind limitations? Uh, what about the topography on Mars? Were you able to map it out so that there are no surprises and an unexpected uh, hill or mountain to, to avoid, uh, you know, that kind of thing? Yeah, so, so obviously, uh, yeah, there are a few different environmental factors that come into play. You know, one is the atmospheric density, which we keep a close look on uh, uh, with, uh, with the help of the Perseverance and the weather station, Meta, that's on there. And they also measure wind. And so, uh, I'll admit, you know, we had some nervousness about it uh, prior to our first flight because we were getting some readings that were indicating that, you know, we were pushing the boundaries of what we tested for here on Earth. That wind wall that I mentioned before, we could produce about 11 meters per second of wind on there and not more than that. And so we were, you know, that, that was sort of our limit. Now, what we've learned is that just as our simulation showed that, you know, we really could go further than that, it, turning out, you know, with Ingenuity on Mars that we're able to do that too. And in particular on flight eight, you know, the uh, wind uh, station on the rover measured about, you know, 20 meters per second uh, wind at the peak. And so it's turning out in reality to be quite robust to that. Uh, as far as, you know, right near the surface, things tend to drop off a little bit, which is great for us because it, it, it you know, it, it makes our takeoffs in particular a little bit uh, easier. Uh, in terms of the terrain, that's an, a great question. It's, of course, you know, it's important, you know, in order not to fly into terrain, but even, even beyond that, you think of, you know, a helicopter or something, you know, it just, you know, can fly above the stuff that's below it. And, and that's, you know, for ingenuity, there is a challenge there because of the navigation system was designed for this very brief technology demonstration where we were on a piece of real estate on Mars that was very carefully chosen and, and you know, to be flat. And so effectively we told the, you know, we told the navigation algorithm, hey, you're flying over flat terrain, which makes, makes it a lot easier for the algorithm to work things up as long as you stick to that. 
And what we've done recently, and in particular in this last fight, is we decided not to really stick to that. And that presented some really interesting challenges. And, and going back once again to the simulation, we spent some time studying the flight ahead of time, figuring out what were the vulnerabilities of that and designing the flight in such a way to try to mitigate the effects of it. You know, we came up to this crater edge and we actually stopped for a moment before then dipping into the crater in order to, to play nice with the navigation algorithm and then sort of the things that we knew that would be challenging for it with that terrain. And it came through on the other side of that flight flying over very challenging terrain over 600 meters uh, to the other side and landed comfortably. Um, I know Greg has a question for uh, Josh, but I, I wanted to say uh, really fast, Hobart, that's fabulous. Like I'm thinking of like almost like a football team coming up with a playbook. Like I'm imagining you with X's and O's and how to utilize the field in the best way. And Bobby, I got to say, I love how you build um, from your past experience to this success and how important it is that all history is acknowledged in the advancement of what we're doing today. So I appreciate that very, very much as a historian. Um, it's great Absolutely. to hear that. And um, so Greg, I think you had a question for Josh. Hey Josh, um, you know, just, just sort of sitting, I think we joked about it in one of the earlier sessions, you know, most people can't get a package home from Best Buy in one piece. Um, you know, so what was sort of the initial launch last July, sort of like for you, the you know, nerve wracking part of the journey. And, you know, you might not know whether the helicopter survived the takeoff and what were really the conditions. And what, what, would that be a fair statement? Describe um, those feelings of, of all that and then having to wait so long to see, uh, see how, it, how it managed the journey. Well, I actually think for all the team um, and probably Bobby too, uh, landing the EDL was the <laughs> kind of the scariest for everyone. Um, I actually had worked on the, the landing radar for Perseverance too, so I was doubly nervous of that, that you know one of my older projects would <laughs> damage my new project. Uh, but <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say, yeah, knowing, like, it, it, I guess as when we're in space, like when we're flying to Mars, there's not a lot we can tell from, like we could tell from the helicopter. Uh, you could only do a few things. You could kind of read temperatures and charge the battery. So really there's no way to tell until we got on the surface and turned on, you know, how much we survived. And until then too, as we progressively tested, you know, spinning the blades, uh, wiggling the servos, all that, it really until flight one, it's, it's very hard to tell how, how much, you know, really survived. So yeah, there was a, a lot from the time we actually put it on the Rover in, you know, March, April timeframe of 2020 uh, until, you know, uh, just a, you know, a, year, a year later, really not a not a good idea of, you know, the state of the vehicle. So it definitely was nerve wracking for a, a long time. You just kind of try to <laughs> try to live with it. And uh, I mean, you know, we had so much other stress throughout the project of, you know, are we going to make it? Is it going to pass this test? Is it going to pass that test? And we kind of maybe all, you know, I think, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, tempered against uh, that stress. But yeah, and, until that first flight, like, yeah, definitely stress for the whole team. Yeah, I, I can add to that I've sort of joke, but it's really not a joke. I told people that there's been a crisis technical or otherwise every week on the project for the seven years since I first came up with it. Uh, so in some sense, I'm kind of immune. It's uh, or at least uh, agnostic as to which one is more stressful than the other. Uh, but they've been it's been a great ride that way, but it's been full of surprises because we're doing things for the very first time. And that's where that Wright brother uh, thing comes in, right? I mean, it, it's just fabulous. Uh, Tim, uh, like I said, after you spoke, I went like this. So I'm almost afraid to ask you anything. So I'm going to throw you a, a softball, as they say. Because I think um, one of the things I'm seeing in the chat and the Q&A again is, is I, people are very interested and intrigued by the fact that a lot of the software that you're using is, is stuff that's actually like you didn't. I mean, you did create a lot, but some of it's actually, uh, I don't even know the right words to use, uh, things that they can use here. So um, if, if you wanna talk about that some more, that would be great. But I'd also like to know what, what you found to be um, the biggest surprise, the, the easiest and hardest surprises um, for you. Um, because I, I, I think everybody has challenges, but sometimes if you're creating something like software, there's there's no basis. Like, how do you, how do you do it? 
Well, uh, you know, I would fall back on what I said earlier about we did have some good experience coming into this to leverage that. But, you know, we just it's one of those things where you have a talented team and you just go in and solve problems. And we had I was a software lead, but we also had other engineers on the team that brought their own software specialties to the and contributed in unique ways that I didn't even anticipate. You know, we, we had a slot to fill with a certain job, but they came on the job and it found out, turned out they had other talents, you know, that we took, took use of and all this stuff fused together to, to make this software work. And, and so <clears throat> I think that was really, really key. And that same, you know, experience in the past really led to that, to formulating that, that software framework that we use. So we had the leverage of other engineers that weren't even on the project, if you will, other JPL engineers uh, that that contributed. And so I this is gonna sound maybe a little funny, but the thing that in some ways worried me the most about um, when we finally got to deploy to Mars wasn't this flight software, but that was my flight software hat, but I was also the operations lead hat. And we had spent the better part of a year designing all these procedures and actually writing software that operates on the ground because the helicopter is not just sitting there waiting for us to talk to it because of energy management we have to put it to sleep and we have to run you know heaters overnight to keep it warm and all those different features have to be managed in a way that uh doesn't endanger the helicopter for instance if we have a wrong setting on a heater and it's running all night at the wrong temperature it can drain the battery to nothing and if we set these alarm clocks in, in an incorrect way so that the helicopter doesn't wake at the same time the rover wakes up, then you got to go find it. You know, so I, I I like to joke, flight one was very stressful in, in you know, in an exciting kind of way, but more so on Hobart. But the actually the first two days were the most stressful for me in many ways, because when we dropped to the surface and we sent the first commands to the helicopter, you know, first of all, echoing what Josh said, it was a great relief that this processor that we hadn't powered on for over a year, it'd been like a year and what, three or four months and we even powered up the main processor on the helicopter. We didn't even know if it would power up. We didn't know if it would talk under the rover because it was under the belly. There's a big metal rover between the helicopter on the, the helicopter antenna and the base station antenna. And we had to set these heaters in order to get through the first night and set the alarm clocks to wake up the next day. And we'd practiced all these all these ground tools and the software that we ran to program these alarm clocks, but we did not, but we had to set it and then we had to basically wait for it to wake up the next day. And that was probably the most stressful time for me as in my role as operations lead was, is it gonna wake up when we told it to? And did we set the heaters correctly to get through the night without completely draining the battery? And were our models and our views of how much energy it would use during the night, was that right? There was a lot of unknowns. And so when we when we were crowding over the, the monitors to see the data on that first day after we dropped and the data came flowing in and we saw that the helicopter woke up within a second of when we told it to, that was that was a glorious moment for me personally, because I was just sweating, you know, all this practice we done and we have this unique asset on the surface of Mars. And did we actually design everything to, to operate it correctly? And so that was, you know, once we got past that, then my heart, my heart rate went down a lot <clears throat> until the first flight, which, you know, then I could celebrate with the team. So I think that's, that's really, for me, my role as the operations lead at that time in the project, we'd spent lots of time testing the software. So I felt pretty good about it. It was more of this brand new set of operations, which was unique to helicopter and everything we'd done to orchestrate that, that when that worked right, that was great. I think you're muted, Amy. If it makes you feel better, everybody around the world was holding their breath and jumped up and down with you. Just, I'm sure you know that, but we all were. It was a beautiful moment for humanity. And, and who, who wakes up within one second after they're told to? <laughs> who yes, does and that? We, and, and you know what's funny is we actually had snooze buttons on the helicopter too. We had subsequent alarms that if for some reason, you know, our, <laughs> missil our rover was misaligned, we could catch it at a slightly later time. Oh, I won't feel so bad hitting that snooze button a couple times tomorrow. <laughs> then. Thank you. You know, we, we could go on and do this forever, I think. Um, I think Amy and I would certainly like to do that. Um, but, you know, conscious of all, you know, all y'all's time, um, I do want to ask Bobby sort of a wrap up question. But Amy, if I could just have the, the one second here, a number of people want to know, and this could be yes or no, and anybody, any of you can answer. 
if ingenuity tips over, does perseverance have any way to not to put it back up? Uh, no, if it tips over, it's end of mission. We'll probably lose the blades, everything. And this, but there's no reason for it to tip over. So it's kind of a moot question. This is not the Martian, the movie. This is uh, Ingenuity on the real Mars. Hmm. Hello? Hi. You, you lost me for a second there. So did anybody, if you answered the tip up yeah, question. Yeah, they answered. Okay. So um, the, the internet connection in the room I'm setting isn't great. Um, so, which I feel kind of embarrassed about given the kind of thing we're talking about here. But uh, Bobby, let me ask you a wrap up question and then, um, and then Amy and I can, can, can close it. So, you know, as we do talked about before very eloquently, I think this, this mission, perseverance and ingenuity really captured the imagination of the country at a, at a key time really, and uh, the world really. Um, so what's next? What, what, what does JPL have in line for, for, for what's next? Well, uh, first of all, we're not done. Uh, Perseverance is still rambling across the surface and in the coming months, we'll be collecting its first samples. Uh, it's there to sample uh, various geological features uh, on Mars uh, and contain those samples and place them in a cache that will later be picked up and actually returned to the earth. Uh, Ingenuity still has uh, flights under its belt. Um, it was designed for five flights and uh, we've exceeded that at this point. Um, but it's uh, ingenuity and perseverance have become one, if you will, and they're working together in tandem uh, for the benefit of science uh, so that we can learn more about Mars. And by doing that, learn more about our own Earth, our own planet, you know, where we came from, uh, where we're heading. Um, if you look broader than that, there's a number of really intriguing missions. Uh, JPL is working on uh, something called Europa Clipper, which will launch in just a few years. It's going to go out to Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter. It's an ice encrusted world with an ocean uh, beneath that ice, uh, larger ocean on Europa than on the earth. And wow. so we're gonna explore that world. Uh, and actually there's a few other ocean worlds in our solar system that are quite attractive for exploration. Uh, I mentioned the samples that Perseverance is gonna take. Uh, we're presently working on a mission to go get those samples. We're basically gonna send a launch vehicle to Mars and we're gonna land that launch vehicle, load up these samples that Perseverance is now acquiring with the scouting help of Ingenuity um, and then uh, return those samples to Earth so that we can study them in our laboratories here on the Earth. That'll be the first round trip mission uh, to or from another planet. Uh, something that has never been done. Of course, we had round trip missions to the moon. Uh, but not to a planet and something that, you know, you would want to do robotically before you try to do with humans. So uh, the future of uh, space exploration is exceedingly bright in this country. Uh, JPL is a part of that, the, the NASA centers. Um, the U.S. industry in this country is just uh, stock full of talent. Um, and we're aggressively pursuing uh, the benefits of space uh, to our society. So this next decade is going to be super exciting for all of us in the field. That's amazing. Well, thank hey. you so much, Bobby. And uh, thank you, team. Um, this is, uh, again, truly a Wright Brothers moment. And uh, from the National Aviation Hall of Fame, we're so honored to have this entire team um, on this webinar. Um, and Greg, over to you. National Aeronautic Association. Yeah, let me add my thanks and the thanks to the National Aeronautic Association, to Bobby, Mimi, and the team, and, and also to Nora Mainland for helping arrange this amazing opportunity. What you all have done is, is absolutely uh, in, incredible. As I said before, it's uh, captured the imagination of, of everyone. And, um, you know, that you all sit there and, and you're, you're all so real and so, so enjoyable. And um, I think our viewers really loved it. So, Thank, thank you, thanks to all of you. Thank you to our viewers. And uh, our next webinar will cover the much more down to earth topic of aviation and travel post COVID. So we'll let you know when that is. Thank you all again to uh, JPL Mars Ingenuity and Perseverance team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thank appreciate you. it. Everyone has to wave. Josh, you're not waving. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.